Hey folks, today we're talking about counting and pick strokes for bluegrass guitar players. I know a lot of you are very reluctant to learn how to count, but I promise if you invest just the tiniest little amount of time figuring out how counting works, then your pick strokes will finally make sense too. And that's kind of a crazy thing to me. Not a lot of people even realize that their pick strokes are incorrect, which can be a huge barrier to speed, consistent tone, consistent volume when you're playing bluegrass guitar. Now I'm going to try to get ahead of some of the first comments that I'm definitely going to get on this video. Number one, yes, I know what cross picking is. I know who George Shuffler is. You should check out my video on cross picking if you want to hear my opinion on down, down, up. Also, yes, there are tons of players who break the alternating pick stroke pattern, but just because Tony Rice breaks the pattern 1% of the time doesn't mean you get to ignore the pattern 100% of the time. That's right, you don't get to use the quirk of the famous player as like a doctor's note that says, please excuse little Timmy from learning how to alternate his pick strokes because Tony Rice uses two upstrokes in a row in the third measure of Church Street Blues. It doesn't work like that. I also wanna say shout out to Bluegrass Breakfast for sending me this sweet Bill Monroe and his Bluegrass Boys shirt. Um, you should give them a follow on Instagram at Bluegrass Breakfast. You can also just check out their website, bluegrassbreakfast.com. They got a bunch of like shirts and trading cards and posters, all bluegrass related stuff. Their content is really cool. So of course I wanted a t-shirt. So before we even talk pick strokes, let's get into the basics of counting. So the first thing that really helps is knowing that a measure is like a fraction. A measure could be filled with one whole note or two half notes or four quarter notes or eight eighth notes or 16 sixteenth notes, 32 thirty second notes, 64 64th notes, so on and so on forever. Now generally in bluegrass notation, we write most simple melodies in quarter notes and eighth notes. So let's talk about that. Remember quarter notes have those uh, lonely stems and they aren't connected to each other. Eighth notes are connected to each other. They sort of are all beamed across the bottom or across the top. A lot of times when we refer to counting, we're actually talking about the oral rhythmic dictation, the idea that you can speak counts with rhythmic intent. So for instance, if I wanted to count four quarter notes, I would say one, two, three, four. I would not say one, two, three, four. <laughs> there has to be a consistency. They all have to be of the same length. Thus one, two, three, four. It's strange that I have to say that, but yes, yeah, speaking in time is the whole point of this. We're trying to play in time, trying to understand how counting works. So don't get lazy. So when we move on from quarter notes and we count eighth notes, we don't just get to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That actually wouldn't make much sense, and I'll show you why. Imagine a pie cut into four slices. These represent our four quarter notes. To create eight eighth notes and eight slices of pie, we have to cut these existing pieces in half. So our original numbers remain, but we have to name all of these in-between pieces something. What we call them is and generally written with a plus sign. So to count quarter notes, I would say one, two, three, four. And to count eighth notes, I would say one and two and three and four and. Without stopping in between and transitioning between the two would sound like this. One, two, three, four. One and two and three and four and. Now let's try some simple combinations of eighth notes and quarter notes. For instance, what if we had half of a measure of quarter notes and half of a measure of eighth notes? How do you think that would be counted? Go ahead, you think about it. I'll be right here. I bet a lot of you found the right answer, but let's think it through anyway. So it's a full measure of quarter notes is counted one, two, three, four. A full measure of eighth notes is counted one and two and three and four and. So if the first half of this measure is quarters and the second half is eighth notes, we can borrow the first and the second half from both of those examples I just gave. That means together we have one, two, three and four and. So what if a measure had one quarter note and then the rest of it was filled with eighth notes? How do you think that would be counted? You'd have to put that dividing line in a different place. Here I go. One, two, and three, and four, and. If that's what you thought in your head, great, good job. Now here's where things might get a little bit tougher. Let's try these four measures in a row. So here you go, ready, steady, here we go. One, and two, and three, four, one and two, 
three and four and one, two, three, four and one and two, three and four. I hope you got that one too. If you're still struggling with this, that's okay. I'm moving very quickly because this isn't a private lesson. I'm trying to sort of teach to a lot of different skill levels right now. So I'm sorry if we're leaving you behind a little bit. You can watch the beginning of the video again. Think about all of those beats and how we might split them in half. And when we split them in half, they become eighth notes. We add the and afterwards. Make sure that all makes sense because reading that four measure example isn't gonna be too tough as soon as you truly grasp that concept, I promise. Okay, so let's talk about how this relates back to pick strokes. So everything that's a number is a down pick stroke, and everything that's and is an up pick stroke. So one and two and three and four and translates to down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. A rhythm like one, two, and three, and four, and down down, up, down, up, down, up. A rhythm like one and two and three, four, down, up, down, up, down, down. So let's go back to that last four measure example and let's actually try to play that on our instrument and figure out the correct pick strokes that go along with it. Remember, every number is a down, every and is an up. Here we go, one, two, here we go. If you need time to think about that, you're welcome to stop and think about that a little bit. I know it's a lot that we just put on the table there, but that is how counting is reflected in pick strokes, and that is the logic jump that you have to make. But with that jump comes a really cool benefit because this means that your right hand is constantly feeling subdivision. It's like your, your, your right hand is a ruler. And you're constantly measuring up against everything. You know exactly where you are in a measure or in the form, you know. Oh, I'm on the and of three. <laughs> it was an upstroke. You start feeling that and you start knowing that, which is really, really interesting. It's like tapping your foot. When you listen to music, you want to tap your foot. And that's what you're doing with this. You're feeling where the pulse is, where the beat is. So if you have trouble feeling where you are in the form or knowing how much time has passed since you started improvising, or even if you can't tell if you're in time or not, this might be the skill that you're missing. And I see that a lot. I see that in a lot of new students. So far, all of the examples have been constant streams of notes. So let's talk about rests because they exist too. Um, rests can take up any duration of a measure, just like a voice note. So you could have a whole rest or a half a rest or a quarter rest or an eighth rest, so on. Uh, but we're gonna be focusing on those uh, quarter rest and those eighth rests. First, looking at the quarter rest, so let's pull that up. These squiggly boys are quarter note rests. They take up a quarter of the measure, just like their voiced counterparts. Essentially, you can imagine that a quarter of the pie is missing. So I would count these measures like this. One, rest, three, rest, one, two, rest, 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 two, three, rest, 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 three, four. It's pretty common for folks to say rest where there is a rest, and also when they're writing things down to put a capital R in the place that was a rest. Next up are eighth note rests. Uh, they're these little elbow looking boys. Um, they take up an eighth of the pie. Speaking of writing the counts is the same. We use the capital R, we say rest. Um, the duration of the rest has just changed. So this passage would sound like this. One and rest and three and four rest. One rest, two and three rest, four rest. One and two rest, rest and four and rest and rest and three and rest and. <laughs> now this one's a fun one because it's eighth notes. So it has alternating pick strokes, but with all of these rests involved, we have a lot of interesting moments with the pick strokes. So let's play this one. Here we go, one, two, here we go. One and rest and three and four. Hopefully you can feel that. So once again, we're pushing forward just because we're teaching to a lot of skill levels 
If you feel left behind, stick at that level. Maybe you can write some of your own exercises. You can think about rhythms that you already know, and you can think how you might write them. For instance, uh, Mary had a little lamb. How would you count that? One and two and three and four. One and two, three and four. One and two and three and four. One and two and three. Stuff like that. You can practice in very interesting ways. The idea is that you're just using the rhythmic dictation as a ruler and you're applying it to music that you're creating or you've already heard. So let's keep going with the guitar specific stuff, specifically articulations, things like slides and hammer-ons and pull-offs. Uh, they're all performed with your fretting hand instead of your picking hand. This means that they won't influence how things are counted, but they will influence pick strokes. For instance, look at these two measures here. Same notes in both measures, but in the second measure, the pairs of eighth notes are played with hammer-ons. This doesn't change the count. Both measures are counted the same. One and two and three and four and. But it does change the pick strokes. Measure one being down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and measure two being down, 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 because my left hand plays all of the notes in between. Now, a lot of times when I ask guitarists to play these two measures for me, they play this. But the thing here is that the hammer-ons, even though I'm playing something with my left hand, hammer-on shouldn't affect the count. The count should still feel like one and two and three and four. And, and right now, the first measure I played sounded like that. It sounded like one and two and three and four and. But when I started playing those hammer-ons, what happened? One and, two and, three and, four and. That's not how our count works. That's not even. That's not good dictation there. So I have to cool it with my left hand. I have to take time to let that hammer-on happen so that the music is still actually in time. Listen to this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. None of this, even in time. That doesn't mean that that other rhythm couldn't appear in some music, even in bluegrass situations, it certainly could. But when we see a rhythm like this as eighth notes, we have to play it like this as eighth notes. Now the same goes for slides and pull-offs, so let's demo those real quick. So in the case of playing a slide, I might do this. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Once again, the temptation, what I don't want to hear is this. So if you're doing this, listen carefully and try again. I don't want to hear this. That's not, that's not in time. You're crushing these two notes together and they don't feel like eighth notes. It doesn't feel like one and two and three and four and anymore. Anyway, sorry, pull offs, here we go. Just trying to keep that rhythm as consistent, as even as possible. All right, for those of you that are feeling super slick about counting, uh, applying pick strokes and the articulation thing, I have six versions of the same lick that you can practice. I have it written in the pick strokes, I have not written in the counts, and I'm gonna play them all at once right now, but it would be really useful practice for you to take these, study them, think about how the time works, how the pick strokes work, and you can use the footage of me to test yourself to see if you're accurate. But just listening to me and using your ear is entirely circumventing the exercise. The whole point here is that we're learning how to count. So if you're just gonna, you know, look at the tab and not look at the rhythms and then listen to how I play them and copy it back, you deserve a slap on the wrist because you're keeping yourself from learning an important skill. So try to use the counting skill to play these. Don't just use your ear, even if you have a great ear, because sometimes that ear isn't gonna be as helpful as you might think. All right, here we go.
All right, everyone, I hope you had a good lesson with the biggest, baddest billy goat in the barnyard. Once again, big thank you to Bluegrass Breakfast for this cool shirt. I love it. I've been wearing it. I've been wearing it too much. It's like the Jim Croce shirt, man. Can't take it off. Remember to follow them on Instagram or check out that website. And as always, if you want more bluegrass guitar content, you can check out my website, lessonswithmarcel.com. You can find the arrangements, the transcriptions, and of course, a place to sign up for Skype lessons with either me or Mickey Abraham. We would love it if you would do that. And uh, well, I guess I'll see you guys soon for some more bluegrass guitar content. See you later.